SCP-049 is a fascinating bundle of contradictions. Arguably, he's the Hannibal Lecter of the anomalous world. He's educated, refined, and cultured. A scientific man with scientific goals, capable of communicating eloquently in both English and medieval French. As anomalies go, he's one of the more cooperative ones contained by the SCP Foundation, willing to understand reason and even showing a small degree of respect for his fellow researchers. And yet despite all this intelligence and refinement, underneath his dark organic cloak, a heart of deep red violence steadily beats. He's capable of ending life with a mere touch, causing all biological functions in the body to simply cease through means that are still unknown to science. Thanks to a series of inconclusive autopsies on SCP-049's unaltered victims, not only is killing easy in a physical sense for SCP-049 with a few notable exceptions, it's also been just as easy on his conscience. Such is the danger of the man or monster who believes unshakably that his goals are righteous. Any moral crime is permissible if done in service of seeing them through. And for those who die at SCP-049's hand, an even greater indignity awaits. His inhuman experiments, the gateway to a second life as an abominable crime against nature, a glob of malignant spit in the eye of God. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, students. We've mentioned SCP-049 countless times in passing before. Some of his strange tales, his interactions with other anomalies like SCP-682, and even with some of your questions and theories about this bone-masked scientific madman. And yet, he still remains a mystery. Perhaps to truly understand this fascinating walking question, we need to return to the beginning and give the classified files behind the Plague Doctor a closer look. Like many of the infamous anomalies discovered by the SCP Foundation, the files indicate that the discovery itself was first triggered by a series of mysterious disappearances in the sleepy town of Montauban, out in southern France. People across races, classes, ages, and genders were simply falling off the map, suggesting a highly indiscriminate assailant. Little did the Foundation know, in the beady avian eyes of their killer, they all had an extremely important commonality. Each and every one of them was infected with the pestilence, the invisible scourge, the great dying. Their killer was the only one with the proper diagnostic mind to even notice the infection. He was the only one who could save the world from this insidious, unseen threat. And then the SCP Foundation discovered his laboratory. The Plague Doctor had been doing his delicate work in an abandoned house on the edge of town. The kind of place that gets whispered about in local rumors. A bad place. A cursed place. Little did they know, it was only the latest in a long line of covert research centers for this singularly inspired medicine man. While some of the details were a little foggy in his memory, he'd been carrying out his work for a little over 400 years now, moving from place to place, causing strings of disappearances wherever he showed up. In his own words, he's an extremely well-traveled man. And still the cure for the blasted pestilence continued to evade him. He sat in that decrepit Montauban house, surrounded by groaning, writhing abominations of his own creation, taking meticulous notes. Nothing would break his concentration, not even the strangers in the black tactical gear with large guns kicking in his front doors. His many cured patients didn't take kindly to the intrusion on their treatment and decided to swarm the interlopers. What followed was a violent struggle between the intruders and the cured, resulting in several of the intruders injured and all of the cured dead once more. During all this chaos, the Plague Doctor never once stopped taking notes. When he was finished with his sentence, he willingly submitted to capture by this mysterious SCP Foundation. After all, when he told them about the true nature of his mission, they would of course see reason and allow him to continue his research. Sure, he may have committed a few crimes against nature on the way, but he was working in service of loftier ideals. You can only imagine his profound relief when he was first interviewed by SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Raymond Hamm in Site 85. 
He was in the presence of fellow scholars, people of science. He worried at first that he'd been captured by some group of common street scoundrels, when in fact, the hands of Providence had delivered him into the perfect place to continue his research. The warm light of fate was now smiling on him after so long languishing in the dark. All he needed to do was allow the scientists around him to conduct tests on his own body, while he conducted tests on others. At first, the SCP Foundation believed he was an anomalous human being wearing a costume, but they soon discovered that he was something very different. What they thought was a mask was actually an outgrowth of his skull, a kind of insect-like exoskeleton. The robes were also a component of his body, a kind of thick hide that developed over the years. The thickness of the hide itself also made him impervious to a great deal of physical damage. Despite his politeness, research notes on the Plague Doctor indicated that Foundation personnel found interacting with him uncanny. There was an oddly eerie quality to him, something indistinguishable that just felt off. The Foundation also found that the Plague Doctor, whom they initially addressed as Doctor rather than SCP-049 out of a sense of mutual respect, also came with a number of strange personal effects. These included a long pointing stick, similar to the ones used by medieval Plague Doctors to touch things without fear of contamination. This stick was soon confiscated. It didn't possess any anomalous qualities, but the Plague Doctor had a tendency to gesture grandly with it as he spoke and the Foundation feared he absentmindedly take someone's eye out with it if he wasn't careful. The other two personal effects that the Plague Doctor prized greatly was his old-fashioned medical bag and the notebook that he obsessively recorded his observations with. The medical bag, which seemed to exhibit anomalous properties, contained a mix of archaic medical tools as well as some that the Foundation has been unable to identify. It's through the tools in this bag that the Plague Doctor is able to create instances of SCP-049-2. As we alluded to earlier, the Plague Doctor can kill with a touch, but that's only part of what he does to his victims. After causing all their biological functions to cease, he takes the tools out of his medical bag and begins performing crude surgery on their corpse, including using a syringe to inject an unknown anomalous liquid into their flesh. While the specifics on the Plague Doctor's modifications can vary from victim to victim, the result is often the same. They're converted into strange, shambling abominations that aren't capable of any kind of higher thought. For the most part, their movements are extremely basic and limited. However, if they're provoked, they can become frighteningly violent, more than capable of killing an armed Foundation guard if they don't remain alert during the engagement. The SCP Foundation was given a unique opportunity to understand more about SCP-049's twisted experiments. As part of his conditions for containment, they agreed to provide the diabolical doctor with a number of fresh test subjects. The doctor was eager to continue his work, and through watching him work, the SCP Foundation could learn a great deal more about him. Though we wouldn't even pretend that the Plague Doctor's work has ever been enjoyable to watch. They presented him with some live subjects and a much greater number of mammalian corpses. He would spend several days working intensely on each one, then documenting his findings in his precious notebook. As a mark of respect for the Foundation scientists around him, the Plague Doctor was more than eager to share his research with them and compare notes. He was always a talkative one, perhaps just as excited to discuss his experiments and theories with like-minded scholars after so many years of working alone. Here are four notable instances. First, the Plague Doctor was presented with a live D-Class specimen. He thanked the Foundation greatly for this gift, then set about his work. He asked the unaware D-Class several questions about his medical history while retrieving tools from his bag, before quickly touching and killing the man. He performed extensive modifications on the D-Class corpse, and when he was resurrected as an SCP-049-2 instance, he was barely recognizable as his original form. He was a bizarre, flailing creature, constantly groaning and gasping from the oblong-shaped hole that the Plague Doctor had carved into his chest. While performing this horrifying work, the Plague Doctor eagerly remarked to the observing researchers that the cure appears to be extremely effective. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat, which he also expressed gratitude for. After performing surgery on the creature, it was successfully resurrected into a bizarre SCP-049-2 instance. 
However, the Plague Doctor readily admitted that this definitely wasn't his best work, commenting, The disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinary practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. The Plague Doctor was delighted by this, commenting that, given primate similarities to human physiology, this would be the next best thing from a true human test subject. However, this research became surprisingly fraught. He killed and reanimated the beast four different times, seemingly unsatisfied with the result each time. And when he failed to reanimate the creature a fifth time, he seemed disconcerted. In a debriefing discussion, the Plague Doctor said, I have learned so much from this. Though I fear my early optimism was misplaced, I hadn't yet come across such a, a, a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Next, it was provided with the corpse of a recently deceased cow. This irritated SCP-049, who wanted test subjects who were physiologically closer to humans. Still, despite his frustration, he continued to work. He took only brief breaks to enjoy a meal of hard cheese, salted pork, and thin crackers. Tests showed that SCP-049 didn't require sustenance to survive, but he enjoyed the act of eating and found that it helped him with his work. He embalmed the cow, rearranging its organs, and even inverted its head. However, this didn't impede his work. He injected it with a variety of liquids, which he described as the essence of the humors. When asked to elaborate further on this, he said, the pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors in balance or the body will reject the cure. This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you have learned this during your education. After being provided a working cattle prod to induce a little electricity into the equation, the plague doctor successfully reanimated the mutant cow. From here, things started to go downhill. Dr. Ham decided to conduct another interview with SCP-049, hoping to get into the finer details of his scientific process. However, they hit some major roadblocks. SCP-049 seemed to be unable to actually articulate the true nature of the pestilence or his process in seeking the cure. Even his notebook wasn't written in any known language and proved impossible to decipher. As the interview went on, the plague doctor seemed to become increasingly distressed, insisting on the importance of his work to helping the human race prosper and survive this terrible plague. All he needed in exchange was more test subjects. The practice civility that had been built up between the Plague Doctor and the SCP Foundation crumbled in 2017, after a tragic incident in the Plague Doctor's cell with Dr. Ham. When he entered to perform a very standard interview with the Plague Doctor, the doctor appeared to become anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well today. Dr. Ham thought nothing of it and tried to continue the interview, but by that point, it was already too late. The plague doctor had come to believe that Dr. Ham was infected with the pestilence. And, of course, there was only one cure. The plague doctor gave Dr. Ham his touch of death. The man died instantly, and the plague doctor immediately went about turning his corpse into another SCP-049-2 instance. Because Ham was killed so quickly, he didn't have time to activate his emergency security signal meaning what was left of him wasn't discovered until three hours later. Guards and researchers were horrified to see one of their own turned into a mindless, deformed monster by an anomaly they all thought they could trust. Following this tragic incident, Dr. Theron Sherman chastised the Plague Doctor for this appalling breach of trust and the cold-blooded murder of Dr. Raymond Ham. The Plague Doctor, in a state of increasing distress, insisted that Ham was infected, and he did all that he could to cure him. And while the Plague Doctor insisted a certain level of scientific distance from his subject, it seemed that deep down, he regretted the loss of a friend and fellow researcher in his endless quest against the pestilence. After this incident, the Plague Doctor truly became SCP-049. He lost all of his privileges and now remains under lock and key in Site-19. Whenever he's transported, he's kept in shackles and supervised by a number of armed guards. After discovering that the scent of lavender has a pacifying effect on him, it's regularly used as a tranquilizer against him during engagements. This is how a cordial ally can become just another prisoner in the eyes of the SCP Foundation. In a summary interview after the Dr. Ham incident, Dr. Elijah Itkin asked if 049 had any regrets about the incident, noting that he seemed oddly mournful. 049 paused before replying, 
mourn. Perhaps I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as… as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. Dr. Itkin replied that 049 would be disappointed on that front. He just laughed in response and replied, <laughs> Oh, doctor, I wouldn't be so sure.